Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about colours, but before I do that, I want to get some audience participation going. I'm going to show you some pictures, and there'll be an arrow pointing to an area of the picture, and I just want you to tell me what colour you can see. It's not a trick, okay? So the very first one, what colour is this? Red, very good. And the next one, what colour is this? Orange, very good. So you can see complicated scenes, perfect. And then this one, what colour is this? Okay, it sounds like blue is just edging out, but for any of you who haven't seen this before, if you're the one person in the world, um, some people perceive this colour, this dress as being blue and black, and other people perceive it as being white and gold. And when this picture appeared on the internet several years ago, colour scientists were thrilled <laughs> beyond belief, um, because it's a really good example of how complicated it is to see colour at all. You're all getting the same sensory input into your eyes, but what you do with that information afterwards is very, very different, and it can completely change the way that you see the world around you. So colour really enriches our daily experience. Um, seeing in colour helps you individuate objects, so it's much easier to find your tent in a field, for example, if you can see in colour, or find your car in a car park. It also helps us work out what things are. So this very suspect grey blog down there is actually a lovely piece of um, melon, I think. Um, and it gives us information about the things we're looking at so we can tell how ripe those strawberries are and whether or not we should eat them as well. Colour is also incredibly salient to us, so map makers like Helen Can use it to pinpoint particular areas of interest to draw our attention, in this case, to nice smells around Brighton, which is where I work. Um, and you often see it in things like underground transport maps that uh, the de designers will use colour to highlight particular routes and things like that. But more than that, colour is something we really, really like. So this scene is not really very much to look at, but seeing it in colour, we have a really strong affective response to it and we think of this as being aesthetically pleasing and something we want to look at. And we can see colour as humans because we're trichromats and that means that we have three colour receptors in our eyes you may have heard them colloquially as being, uh, temporarily forgotten, a green, red, and blue colour receptors. They're actually sensitive to specific wavelengths of light rather than specific colours. And our brain takes combinations from these different signals to work out what exactly it's looking at. So it will say, okay, this thing is exciting my uh, long, my green wavelength cone this much and my red wavelength cone this much. This thing must be orange, for example. We can represent the way that we see colour in these mechanisms with a diagram like this. Um, so what you see on the horizontal axis here, L means long wavelengths of light, which is reddish. M means green wavelengths of light, which are medium wavelengths. And uh, this, kind of, this combination of signals tells the brain how red or green something is. And on the vertical axis, S means short wavelengths of light, which is blue wavelengths of light. And so that axis tells us how blue or yellow something is. You don't need to remember all that. <laughs> what you basically need to know is that this diagram represents the biological mechanisms behind how we see colour, and that colour is a combination of, of information from these signals. And once this signal reaches the brain, we begin to do very strange things with it. So everyday things that you don't even think about. So you, some of you probably have a favourite colour, and that's really weird. Having a favourite wavelength of light is bizarre, no matter how you look at it. <laughs> We do stuff like we see colour illusions as well, like the dress, for example. But something incredibly every day that we do is that we talk about colour. So colour is a continuum. When you look at this circle, there's no obvious place that you say, OK, well, I'm going to put this in one group and then I'm going to put that in another group. There's no obvious place to make these categories. We can discriminate millions of colours, but we have a limited number of categories that we put these colours into. So, for example, all of these shades, more or less, depending on what projector you're looking at them, you will group them together and you'll say, these things are all the same, they are green. And the exact word you use in your language might be slightly different, but you get the idea, you kind of put them all together in one group. And in English, this is roughly how we would divide up the colour spectrum. Again, it slightly depends on what projector you're looking at, but you, you get the idea. There might be some disagreement around the boundaries, but this is more or less how it's done. So we have 11 basic colour categories. We've got these ones that you can see on screen, and then we also have black, white, and grey. And <laughs> the, um, some people suggest that by categorising, we then change the way that we see the world. It can change our perception of, of what's going on around us. 
And I'm going to illustrate that for you now. So I'm going to show you a screen of dots, and one of them will be an odd one out. And I just want you to look for the odd one out. So the first one, has everyone seen it? Yes. OK, just good. And this one, can everyone see this one as well? Very good. And then this one, where's the odd one out here? So I, I can't see it, which is a bit worrying. <laughs> but it's, it's that one just there, top right corner. It's very slightly different. So when things are within category, they're harder to spot. It will take you a longer time to find it. Because perceptually, the difference between colors becomes smaller compared to if I showed you a blue dot in a, gray, in a green surround. The perceptual difference will seem much, much larger just because it's a different category. So it's possible that the way you categorize colors can influence the way you see colors in the world around you. But that's just the beginning of it, because I was slightly misleading earlier when I said we put all of these in the same group, because there are some languages that would say, these colors are not all the same. They're not all green. So the Himba, who are a semi-nomadic group who live in northern Namibia, would see three color groups here. They would call this light color Dambu, this uh, dark green Zuzu, and then this mid-green Buru. And they would also put in this Buru category a color that we would call blue, something completely different. And some researchers suggest that this would mean on that task where you're looking for the odd green out, they would be a little bit faster, by a matter of milliseconds, but faster. And in the one where you see the blue dot in the green surround, they'd be very slightly slower than us to find it because it's in a different category. That finding is actually a little bit controversial. It's something that researchers are still looking at at the moment. But it's a very interesting idea that the way you talk about the world might change the way you see it. So this is how the Himba divide up the color spectrum. So they have five color groups. And they're one of many languages which have a, a really big gru category. So rather than a green and a blue category, they have one large category in the middle. And so we have this data from something called the World Color Survey, which was a survey of 110 languages where they went around and they showed little patches of color, and they asked, what color is this? And they got people to categorize them. And they found that it looked on the surface of it like different languages are talking about color completely differently. So you can have languages that have got five color terms, six color terms, seven color terms, and so on and so on. And actually, although it looks like what's happening is totally arbitrary, if you take all these languages to, um, and average them together, you see consistent patterns. So if you know a language has six color terms, for example, you can more or less guess how they might divide up the color spectrum. So this suggests that there's something underlying the way we talk about color that we haven't even realized is going on. And there's more evidence about this from the people that I spend most of my day with, who are babies. <laughs> so um, I work at the Sussex Baby Lab at the University of Sussex. And I spend a lot of time with people who are below six months old. <laughs> And babies are a really, really good way of finding out how we come prepackaged into the world and how we learn to understand the things around us. And it can go a great way to explaining how ad why adults act the way they do. They're also really fun to work with on a day-to-day -day basis, much more interesting than anyone else. <laughs> so interestingly, contrary to popular belief, babies, can't, um, babies can see in color. A lot of people think that babies can only see in black and white. This isn't true. They can see in some color from birth. And then by the time they're uh, between three and four months old, their color mechanisms, like the ones that I showed you in the diagram earlier, are roughly equivalent to those of adults. It's just like the saturation dial has been turned down a little bit on the world. And even though they don't have any language, um, they also categorize color. And they seem to do it in quite a similar way to adults. And when my, uh, the leader of my lab, Anna Franklin, told me about this, I thought this was kind of amazing. The idea that you could categorize colors without having any language seemed utterly bizarre and a little bit mind-blowing. But exactly how they did it was a little bit unclear. And we wanted to better understand, well, where do babies make their color categories? And what are they doing it with if they don't know any words? So that's what we wanted to find out. When I tell people I work with babies, they're often a little bit surprised that you can find out anything at all about what a baby is thinking. But one thing that babies do do all the time is they look at stuff. And the way they look at stuff is actually very predictable. So if you show them a face, for example, paired with a geometric figure, they would always rather look at the face than whatever else you're showing them. So we can use looking time measures to tell us more about what a baby is thinking. And one of those methods we use is called novelty preference. And this is based on the idea that babies would rather look at something new than, over, than something they've seen loads of times before. 
So if, for example, I showed a baby this cat over and over again, and then I showed them this other cat, they can tell it's a different cat, but they just don't care. <laughs> they just don't, they don't want to know because they've already seen loads of cats. It's very boring. Compared to if I show them this cat again, and then I pair it with this incredibly happy dog, they're going to look for longer at this dog because not only is it physically different, it's also conceptually different to them. And so that's what we do with colours. We show babies one colour over and over again, and then we pair it with a new colour, the next one along in the spectrum, and we look to see, do they look longer at this new colour than at the old colour they're already familiar with? So this is what it looks like in my testing booth. It's very retro looking, but it works. <laughs> My supervisor optimistically calls it a baby cinema, but it only ever shows the same thing, and not that many babies like it. <laughs> um, so the babies see the colour, and then there's that little circle in the middle where the researchers, who are me and a researcher called Gemma Catchpole, can sit behind and watch um, how long babies are looking at colours. And there's a little monitor in the middle that plays little cartoons to keep babies on board. <laughs> in a, in developmental science, we expect about a quarter of our participants to not want to do it at all. Um, so I tested several hundred of babies, and then there's kind of an extra quarter who, who just said no. And uh, a lot of people say to me, oh, isn't that really hard? And uh, if your participant just starts crying, and I quite like it, because at least you know they're just not going to do it. It's, <laughs> it's quite useful. Um, so I have a little example of what it looks like for a baby doing the test. Um, but basically what you can see is that babies do really clearly look at things. So um, the colours come into shot and the baby just isn't passively kind of rolling around. It does properly look at the thing because it wants to know what it is. Babies are constantly trying to under, understand their, um, their environment. They're constantly taking statistics on the world that they can see. And babies have a little bit of a bad rep of being a little bit hopeless in a lot of ways. But you learn more in the first few years of your life than you do in the rest of your life. So I think we should probably cut them a little bit of slack. So I showed several hundreds of babies some colours. And this is what my colours look like in that diagram I showed you earlier. So this basically shows you the, um, the way that my colours work in relation to the biological mechanisms of colour vision, in case you wanted to know. And if we look at how babies group them together, they group them like this. So babies have got five colour groups that we would call blue, green, yellow, red, and purple. And what's really interesting about this is that the underlying mechanisms of colour of color vision provide a natural fault line for babies to divide up their colour categories. So when you don't have language, you rely on low-level sensory input in order to make sense of the world around you. But as well as that, when we compare the way that our babies categorise colour to the way that adults speak about colour, we find that the places where babies are making their category boundaries to the point where they're saying this belongs to a different group to something else coincide to where adults do it. So it looks like we're all working from the same low-level template that we then use um, as we learn language and culture we build upon. So if you are in a language that doesn't make a categorical distinction between green and blue, for example, then you'll just learn to not do that as well, even though you've got a bias to do that when you're very, very young. Because colour, talking about colour is, after all, about communication. It's all about explaining to other people what's going on in your world around you and how to make sense of it. So the next things that researchers would like to do would be to properly understand, well, how does learning language interact with the, with the way you talk about colour? And how does it change the way that you see the world? Is it the case that these babies who are younger see the world in a different way to they do as they start to learn language? Um, and also, we'd obviously, we've only tested babies who live in Brighton. Obviously, it'd be very good to test babies from around the world in lots of different cultures to make sure that it is the case that it is these low-level sensory biases that are dividing up the world for us. But what about for you? So I realise this is a lot of information <laughs> that I've just told you about the way we talk about Keller. And I have two kind of main take-home messages for you. So one of them is that colour is, is more than just a pretty thing that we find aesthetically pleasing. The way that you see colour is shaped by your environment around you, by the language that you learn, and by your experiences of the world. But also, babies are not as bad as you think they are, because a lot of people think that babies are really, really hopeless. And they can actually tell us a great deal about our world and how we see the world that we do. So they're better than we give them credit for, essentially. Thank you very much. <laughs>